Okay, so now that we've got the project idea, we're following the rules, we're not gonna cheat, where do we find the supplies and equipment for our science project? Some projects require sophisticated instruments. Others will work with something very simple, like this is a voltmeter. This is an expensive one, it's several hundred dollars, but this one's very cheap. So you can find voltmeters that are, you can find them, I've seen them in Walmart for 10 or $11. And if you need a voltmeter or a resistance meter, they are available. If you want a fancy one, talk to your teacher. Maybe you can borrow one from, the, from your school, or maybe uh, your dad or mom or somebody they know might have one that they can loan you. There's other, there's other things you can also uh, get. Now, my daughter, uh, I told you about Sarah, when she, when she collected dust, she just simply used a microscope slide. Set the slide out in the open, make sure that it won't be blown away by the wind, come back a day later, and the surface of that slide will have dust on it, just like the windshield of a car or a window. And she, can, and she studied her uh, dust that way. Now, she used a microscope to do that, and it was a $30 microscope. And when, when she put her, was setting up her project at, the, at a regional science fair, uh, and, and which ended up where she won major awards, one of the officials came by and, and sort of sneered at her microscope and said, why are you using such a cheap toy microscope when you could have used a much better one probably from your school? Well, she was in a small Christian school at the time and didn't own a microscope and we could only afford a $30 one. She made a major discovery. She discover, discovered and studied Asian, I'm sorry, African dust arriving here in Texas from the Sahara Desert using a $30 microscope. Her first work was dis, uh, discovering the spores and smoke from Yucatan was with that $30 microscope. It was so exciting that we bought her a nice fancy digital microscope, but the initial discovery was made with a $30 toy microscope. A camera is another vitally important research tool. And I've got my uh, phone here on my hip. That's the, one of my cameras, I have several others. Uh, if your phone has a camera, and if it's a good camera, especially if it can take close-up photographs, use your camera. You can email the photographs to yourself, download them, and then you can print them up for your project. Uh, you can also find, if you want a, a, fa a fancy camera, you can go to a pawn shop, get your parents' permission, and you can find very high-quality cameras for $100, $150 at a pawn shop, maybe even less than that. Maybe the pawn dealer will give you a camera if you tell them you're wanting to use it for a science fair project. Computer. A computer is very handy. Your school has computers. Maybe your parents have a computer. Maybe you have a computer. But with a, a computer and some simple software, and you can get free software on the web, you can make graphs and charts, and you can do spreadsheets. So that's very, very important capability. You also can type your report on the computer. Uh, chemicals and glassware. Some of you will need that for a science project. Glassware is highly regulated in most states. And that's because drug people who make drugs use glassware to do their illegal drug making. So maybe it's necessary to borrow glassware from your school chemistry lab or a nearby university chemistry lab. Just be sure not to break it so you can return it and, uh, undamaged. I mentioned multimeters uh, as, a, as a key thing, uh, oscilloscopes. Those are available in most high schools. And there may be other instruments. One of the best instruments I have is this thing right here. It's called an infrared non-contact thermometer. And all you do is you point it at what you're going to measure the temperature. Well, here's my notebook. By the way, a notebook is a really important part of your science project. This notebook has got waterproof pages. And the reason I use these is in Brazil, I had a regular notebook and it was so humid tranking, uh, going, going through the rainforest there that my notebook just became a soggy mess. I couldn't even write in it. So I shifted to these waterproof notebooks. But anyway, uh, temperature of this notebook in Fahrenheit is 91.1 and the ground is 87.4. Well, why is the ground cooler? Well, there's grass and the grass is evaporating water and that tends to cool the ground. Now the air is 82.8 and the higher we point it, the lower it goes, 66, 60, 59, and then hit the tree branches. And if I kept pointing it straight up and there weren't any clouds, it would be below freezing. That's because it's measuring the temperature of the upper atmosphere. This is a valuable tool. And you can buy infrared thermometers for as little as $19. This one's 49. It's an extremely good one. It's a Kintrex, K-I-N-T-R-E-X. I've written a scientific paper about how these can be used to measure the total water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, that was in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And NASA saw that article and they did a follow-up study and found out that, by golly, he's right. You can use one of these to measure total water vapor. Total water vapor is important. This is carbon dioxide in this little bottle. These are from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. And the carbon dioxide was at 407.3 parts on, uh, June, on June the 2nd, 2016, when I took this sample here. Carbon dioxide is a very important greenhouse gas. 
But the most important greenhouse gas is water vapor, which you can measure with this. To measure carbon dioxide, you need several thousand dollars or more of high quality equipment, but water vapor is very easy to measure. It's a good thing since it's such an important gas. Now that you're ready to go with your project, you've looked at the rules, you've looked at supplies and what you can get and what you can afford, what do you do next? Let's do the work. First of all, think of a good title for your project. Sarah called her project on detecting fungal spores in smoke, smoke bugs. It's a clever title. It catches attention, it's short, it's not overly fancy. So try to think of a clever, short name for your science project, one that can be easily posted on the top of your science fair display board. Number two, what is your goal or objective? Not what is your hypothesis, what is your objective? What is your question? What are you trying to do? Is there a problem you want to solve or is there a problem you want to answer? That's what you want to have on your science, uh, as a goal for your science project. We've talked about supplies. Make a list of the supplies that you're going to need. Will you need to borrow any of these? If so, put a little box, a little check box there for you to check off after you've arranged for that. Otherwise, you'll forget to do it and you won't have your, your instrument when you need it. Uh, list the safety precautions you're going to need to follow. That's very, very important. That way you stay in tune with the International Science and Engineering Fair people and you uh, will more easily pass their rules. And while it's not always required, it's very important, I think, to list some references for your project. Uh, go online if, you, if you're a big fan of Wikipedia, which has improved in recent years but still has a lot of biases. Let's say you're studying um, uh, cone flowers. I'm looking at a cone flower in the field here. Go to Wikipedia, type in cone flowers, and then don't copy anything off Wikipedia in the first place. Just use it as a general source. Look down in the references. Oh, here's a book about cone flowers. Find that book in the library or find it online. That's your reference, not the Wikipedia article about your reference. Now, most school science fairs are held during the fall, and that's not good because it doesn't give you much preparation time. You start school in late August, early September, you've got a science fair that may be held in a few months. So you don't have much time. Plus, you may be in sports, you may be in a play, you got homework assignments. Let me give you a tip. Do as my kids did. Do the bulk of your science fair project in the summer. And when school starts, you'll be way ahead of everybody else. That's really, really important. Now, let's see how we've discussed, these, how these topics we've discussed can be used in a real science project. <laughs>